Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Data Race Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Uh, welcome to a, another session for the Vaccination Data Race Seminar Series, Booster Edition. We're excited today to have Harry Sunan S. Uh, he is a Group Engineering Manager at Microsoft on the Azure Cosmos DB team. Um, he's been at Microsoft since 2008. Prior to that, he worked on the SQL Server Database Engine. Uh, he did his master's degree at, at University of Washington and his undergrad at Fitz Pilate, which is a good school. Um, so as always, if you have any questions for Hari as he's given the talk, feel free to unmute yourself, say who you are, and fire your question to him anytime. The way he's not talking to himself. And Hari, again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. Go for it. Certainly, I uh, really appreciate uh, this opportunity to uh, talk with uh, people from CMU and affiliated to it. Uh, so, uh, so I think Andy already uh, provided my intro, so I'll probably dive right into it. Uh, so here, uh, we are going to talk about uh, uh, HTAP with Azure Cosmos DB, um, and uh, this is hybrid transaction analytical processing. And uh, so uh, the problem statement that we were after in this particular uh, endeavor uh, is that uh, we saw that a lot of customers uh, were trying to take data out from our OLTP transaction store, uh, trying to have a pretty sophisticated ETL pipelines, et cetera, and to insert data into some uh, other analytic system just for doing operational analytics. Uh, so the cost uh, and the effort uh, that was uh, on the customer side for this, it was pretty high. And we, th we said, why don't we try to solve this problem for customers and try to uh, make it seamless, but the most important thing was, can we reduce the cost uh, for the customers in having to uh, get to this operational analytics? So that kind of summarizes the problem statement that we are after here. And um, uh, so it's it's a pretty simple problem statement, but uh, it's it, the way we thought was it was a sick way to uh, solve more problem for customers, uh, uh, you know, in making a, in making their um, presence in Azure uh, more uh, more rewarding. So in terms of the next set of goals that we are after here uh, is that uh, when we th when we think analytics, right, uh, we didn't want to in invent a new language or anything at this point. Uh, to, uh, so we wanted to uh, meet where the customers are. And so uh, we kind of uh, try to make it uh, interoperable with uh, Spark and T-SQL where a lot of mindshare exists in order to uh, do analytics on top of our data. So some of the value prop of our Cosmos TB uh, uh, OLTB transaction store is that customers continue to use, take advantage of the schema freedom that we provide in terms of the JSON documents. Uh, so they don't have to do database development and they can evolve application semantics at a pretty high rate. Um, and so we want to continue to preserve that in our pursuit of enabling uh, analytics on top of our data. So apart from the schema freedom uh, being globally distributed and elastic, uh, which means that customers can do uh, local region uh, data access in each of their regions in which their applications are presented, as well as they're able to uh, increase the storage and throughput at a, without any a lot of pre-planning uh, because we are able to do that seamlessly while being online for workloads. Uh, those experiences have to carry forward uh, in this HTAP uh, uh, addition of offering too. So those were some of the first principles uh, that we had uh, in designing this. So the first and foremost is that uh, you know our customers are uh, take uh, advantage of the low latency uh, single digit millisecond latencies for reads and write operation on the OLTP, and uh, we don't want to, to regress on that. And this means that the analytical queries, the disk bandwidth, IOs, and the query computation, the CPU cost, etc. We wanted to keep it off of the uh, hot path engine so that our OLTP workloads are not uh, uh, you know affected in any way. So just, uh, just reiterating that uh, we want to continue to have the same SLEs for OLTP that we have had before. Mm -hmm. And this also uh, naturally, a natural derivation is that uh, we don't do any uh, remote uh, IO transactions, et cetera, and the OLTP user transaction path because of this new addition offering. Uh, we, we wanted to continue to keep uh, the transaction path as light as possible. So in terms of the feature set itself, we wanted to expose analytics with archival support. And the reason for archival support is that, you know, usually customers want to address a larger uh, space of data, like a two-year history and so on. 
um, in, in, in for their analytical view while uh, truncating the OLTP to a smaller working set that they usually uh, update and modify. Uh, so we wanted to enable that uh, opportunity here. And that means that uh, we do need a much cheaper storage medium uh, in order to enable such uh, large amount of data for analytical uh, queries and time travel queries and snapshots, which kind of go along with it, uh, are some of the things that we wanted to um, add as a add into our roadmap as we plan this architecture. And uh, going back to where, where we started, it is to uh, reduce the total cost of ownership of the operational analytics space and uh, trying to keep the data within the ecosystem. So, with that, um, in terms of what we are really looking at, uh, right? Um, we have uh, customers using SQL API, our core offering, and MongoDB API, and so on. We have other offerings too. Um, and the, the customers kind of insert their data uh, using these APIs into our transactional store. And we kind of have a decoupled storage medium, which uh, keeps data in a format that is efficient for analytics, uh, which is uh, the column store format. And we try to keep the storage in sync and uh, make sure that the freshness is maintained and also uh, the data is kept transactionally consistent while being able to serve uh, queries with snapshot isolation from all these analytical uh, query run times that are on the right side. And so this isolation, the fact that the query runtimes do not reach to the uh, do not reach out to the transactional store during query execution was uh, uh, one of the core things that uh, uh, we uh, wanted to achieve through this. So in this uh, uh, entire screenshot that you have in front, uh, the central box of how uh, the storage is designed and how it works with all the high availability, geo replication and elasticity features, et cetera, and how things are kept in sync and uh, what is the format, et cetera. Those are some of the topics that I'm gonna go uh, deep into uh, in the subsequent uh, slide. So that's the box I'm gonna focus on. So in terms of the storage options, since we said that, okay, it's gonna be a decoupled storage and we wanna reduce the amount of processing that happens on the OLTP database engine to maintain this decoupled storage, uh, log structured storage seems like a, a pretty good choice because writes are batched and uh, amortized and the number of IOs we do uh, is uh, pretty uh, set. And so that uh, it doesn't add any uh, unpredictable uh, order of end operations or anything like that for uh, persisting one batch of uh, operations. So we did uh, go with uh, log structured storage. And so it's a pen only storage as a lot of this audience would be aware of and where replaces and deletes generate invalidations for the old versions of the records. And um, uh, you know, delete generates tombstone markers and so on. And the writes are batched and done in the background. And the unit of write, as I will refer to uh, again and again in the uh, subsequent slides, is what we call as a segment. This is the unit of writes that we have batched into one file, and we make it uh, durable. And that's what we call as a segment. So we can think of this as a, a segmented uh, storage system. If uh, uh, any of you have come across that such a thing before. So now the introduction of uh, our format. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we didn't, uh, we, we started on this journey from scratch and we didn't have a format earlier. And uh, we thought, uh, why don't we, why should we introduce a new, uh, a new format of our own making, uh, which may not, which may lack interoperability with other open source libraries and readers and ecosystem tooling support, et cetera. So uh, we started, uh, we, we decided on starting with just the parquet as a base format. Uh, for that we will use. But again, Parquet as any, any column format uh, is, um, it needs work on top to uh, reflect updates and deletes uh, in an efficient way. And as well as, um, you know, a table format on top is also required uh, in order to make sense of the uh, entire gamut of files that are present in a folder. Right. Uh, so uh, we ch we chose to be simpler uh, with at least the base format, so that um, our, uh, you know um, the unit of read could be uh, easily readable uh, with the several uh, open source libraries that are present. Uh, for uh, uh, I think uh, quite a few of you might have uh, had to deal with Parquet earlier. Uh, so it's a columnar format where a bunch of rows could be uh, grouped together uh, before coalescing into columnar chunks, uh, which we call as row groups, uh, the row set of rows that are grouped together. And uh, um, each column chunk has a, bunch, uh, has a set of pages and so on and so forth. Uh, but the important uh, two points that I want to highlight about this um, format itself and uh, the one that, um, you know, that's very important for uh, our context is that Parquet requires upfront schema before writing data. 
uh, which means that uh, uh, us being a schema-free JSON doc document uh, data model, uh, we do need to do schema inference. So we did uh, implement a schema inference component uh, that kind of uh, uh, computes the union schema, does upcasting, uh, does a lot of that, uh, and uh, converts that into a parquet schema. So there are some gotchas within compatible data, con data type conversions and so on, but parking that aside, um, uh, it is um, uh, that that's the um, that's the mechanism we use in order to uh, uh, write a schema from the data that was uh, schema list to begin with. And one of the most important things with JSON in general is that uh, it it has cap capabilities so to support nested structures, uh, nested objects, and so on, and uh, a number of levels of nesting, and uh, uh, also um, a lot of these fields are optional in nature in JSON, like uh, the number of uh, items can repeat zero or more times and so on and so forth. So in order to persist the nested levels and everything in a way that it is uh, captured with full fidelity, such that you, when you reconstruct the JSON row from the parquet uh, data, it needs to be exactly identical the way we sent it earlier. Uh, right, and that involves uh, uh, quite some encoding, and uh, we again choose to do something that is more commonly uh, done, uh, which is Dremel encoding. This is a picture from the Dremel encoding paper, and uh, this is where uh, we encode de uh, definition repetition levels uh, for optional in order to disambiguate whether optional fields are present or not, um, and how many times the array elements have repeated, and so on. And so this also has a wide adoption. Um, in the Spark AMR libraries and uh, in the Spark ecosystem and so on. So uh, that's something that we adopted. And uh, you know our backend is, is done in C++, so we kind of did it on top of the C++ arrow library. But uh, um, the reason we adopted this encoding because um, quite a few readers uh, did the decoding pretty well in the uh, OSS ecosystem. Okay. So summing uh, all of whatever we spoke in bits and pieces together, uh, you know, uh, coming back to the big picture a little bit here. Uh, so we have uh, OLTP transaction traffic that's coming to Cosmos DB's uh, shards. Uh, we are a shard system by default. Um, and um, uh, each of these shards maintain the analytical storage uh, footprint of their own uh, in the in a decoupled storage. And um, any other, any analytical runtime like Spark or T-SQL would just talk to the um, decoupled storage, uh, contain the IOs and the everything to just that medium and uh, be able to serve analytical queries. So that's uh, that's kind of summing up uh, what, uh, you know, uh, a little bit on the big picture before I go further in depth into the log structured story itself. What did I, sorry, you maybe said this, what does I and V stand for? Uh, I'm, I'm going to come to that, Andy, in a bit. Okay. Uh, they, okay. they are something called as invalidation files. I'll, I'll, I'll be deep diving into it, yeah. Got it, okay. All right, so uh, you know, uh, going a bit deeper uh, into the next levels of log structured storage. So let's say that we have writes and we have batched a first set of hundred records and return to the segment one, and the next set of ninety records to segment two, the next set of eighty records to segment three, and the next set of ninety records to segment four, etc. The important thing to note here is, even though we said appendently storage, etc., they are not actually physically uh, uh, co-located with each other. The subsequent blocks. So, uh, one dot parquet is written to storage stamp one. Uh, two dot parquet is written to storage stamp two, etc. And uh, so they are. Uh, we uh, did this deliberately in order to uh, kind of spread the bandwidth because uh, you know uh, we have since we are targeting a cheaper storage medium for this, um, the bandwidth uh, constraints might also be a little harsh. And so we wanted to make sure that we are able to spread the writes across uh, several such stamps uh, to be within the bandwidth limits and also be able to um, you know uh, keep the cost low and uh, keep the latencies for showing up in analytical storage low. So, um, which means that in order to logically stitch things together to form a logically consistent view of the database at any point in time, um, we would need something like a root segment. That's, that's what we call it. But in database systems, you would have uh, you know heard of checkpoint files, manifest files, et cetera, in different systems. So it's our equivalent. Um, so every segment ID has a corresponding uh, physical URI. And uh, uh, so uh, that's how they are uh, tied. And these physical URIs, one dot URI and two dot URI, could actually be in different data centers, but within the same region. Um, and that enables us to uh, be resilient to capacity constraints within any one particular re uh, data center, et cetera, and, and so on. 
Um, and we also have something called, this is a very smaller um, mini, um, miniature view of the root segment. There's much more uh, complicated stuff in it, but um, in, but this conveys the essence. Uh, so in terms of the statistics, we have things like hey, uh, the total number of records, uh, what are the uh, number of invalid records at any one point, and um, so on and so forth. And this, this is one number that would change, right? Because if I had written some keys into segment one, and if I have uh, replaced or deleted it uh, in segment two and segment three, um, then it means that the number of invalidations in segment one is going to continue to go up. If it becomes completely invalid, our query run times will ignore the file. Uh, if it becomes more than 50% invalid, our garbage collection compaction will pick it up um, and so on and so forth. And the other column that we have here is the transaction ID. Uh, which is the o OLTP transaction ID with which uh, these records were associated with. And this enables us to provide the uh, snapshot isolation marker for any queries that start off of the uh, query runtimes. And we also have a property bag in it, uh, which says something like uh, last durable segment ID, last durable transaction ID, et cetera. And these are the uh, markers at which uh, the a query that starts right now uh, holds on to and provides the version of the database that is uh, consistent as of this particular transaction ID. All right, and so um, this also enables us to continue to uh, persist new writes, continue to mutate root segment, et cetera, with new updates, though the query that started already uh, we'll continue to provide an earlier version of the data. Okay. So uh, now um, I'm going to go a bit deeper into the invalidation and the INB files that uh, I've been showing. Uh, to understand that better, uh, there is a concept that um, uh, that I've shown here, which is log offset. Okay. Uh, so it's a logical offset, and it refers to a, a logical location in which this version of the key is currently present. That is the latest version of a key is currently present in the decoupled storage medium. And so it's a triplet. What it says is one zero two zero one nine. What it says is the, the latest version of this key is currently present in uh, segment one row group zero and at the row index of two zero one nine. That's what it says. And the reason we maintain uh, this is if there is a, a subsequent updates uh, using replaces or deletes uh, we would be able to generate invalidations uh, for the old uh, locations uh, without having to look up into the decoupled storage. And these invalidations that we generate will be persisted in the INV files. I have something to show for that in the next slide. And these invalidation uh, offsets would be um, used by the query runtimes to um, push down as a filter predicate to consider these uh, rows as invalid. And so that it won't even materialize those rows uh, it will invalidate those rows uh, before materialization. Okay, how do we actually generate these invalidations? Uh, just an animation to so, show that um, we have. A, let's say we have a the this this is the content in the OLTP table as of this point, and we have uh, two documents and with these as keys. And let's say the doc one is getting a new version because it's getting a replace operation. Uh, we are replacing it with uh, a version two. Okay, and uh, so the current file that's accepting writes for the log structured batch uh, segmented write is three, and it's going to allocate a new offset in three for the new version of the doc one. However, it's also going to add an invalidation for the current offset of uh, the version one of the document one, doc one, right? And so, um, and once we allocate a new offset, it is written back and the transaction is committed when with the new log offset. So you can imagine that there are some crash recovery scenarios that this opens up where uh, the in-memory writes are uh, the in the three dot uh, segment is not yet persisted or remote checkpointed. And um, so there is an operation log behind this document table that I mentioned here that I haven't necessarily shown in the PPT that's, that serves as a write ahead log uh, for the analytical storage so that uh, we can recover all the versions uh, without loss, uh, even if it, there is a, a crash. And once the, a good number of writes have accumulated into three, um, I have shown just one here, um, it will be flushed to remote. And, the, and this act of flushing things to remote doesn't make it immediately visible to any queries. Uh, it's only the next step of checkpointing that actually uh, makes it visible in the root segment. Uh, so the three dot file um, is now, if you just see the difference between the previous uh, root segment and now, the difference is that three is now valid with a bunch of records in it, hundred records, and not just that. The once invalidation count went up by one, so from ten to eleven. 
right, as part of uh, committing this. So it's either and the causality and the effect would be both visible. That is a new version of the document that got invalidated will be present in three, as well as the invalid count on one will go up uh, or neither would be visible. So uh, that's the atomicity for this. And in terms of the- Out of curiosity, what's the average size of like your parquet files in, in Cosmos? Uh, so uh, we try to um, uh, so that there is a uh, there is a trade off there between staleness and the size and I have a slide on that how we um, balance both uh, and we try to achieve around uh, the 300 to 400 MB of uh, parquet file at the minimum uh, so that uh, you know query performance uh, doesn't have to suffer due to too, too many IOs yeah. So in terms of invalidation design itself, um, one thing we had uh, um, uh, in mind is that we don't want to do uh, too many IOs in the uh, in the frontline path. Uh, the, in order to keep the pressure low on the uh, um, on the frontline transaction path, even though we are not doing the remote IO on the frontline transaction path, we still want to. Uh, keep the latency uh, to reflect it in the remote uh, analytical storage low. And so some of the principle we started with was that one parquet file data file flash should also involve just one invalidation file flush, right? Um, but because one data file flush can actually accumulate invalidations for many segments in the past, uh, including itself, um, but um, uh, that shouldn't end up in us doing so many number of IOs into the number of segments it touched uh, in order to persist those invalidations. So this is something so that we uh, said in order to uh, kind of uh, keep the pressure on the OLTP system low. And this should, uh, such a design should also allow for snapshot isolation of queries because we are not uh, changing any data, not doing any in-place updates. So anything that started off with the previous version should continue to work. And the queries and ingestion should be completely decoupled such that um, uh, you know queries don't get blocked on some rights that are trying to checkpoint uh, and uh, and vice versa so that uh, uh, you know one doesn't uh, hold on hold on, hold the processing on the other and to kind of accommodate uh, these uh, statements uh, the invalidation itself is a log stream um, and the inv invalidation files, though they have called out as INV, it's just semantically different, but physically they are just parquet files themselves. Um, and that allows us to kind of uh, uh, compress the, it's just nothing but an array of uh, offsets along with some metadata about which transaction made it invalid. And uh, it allows us to kind of, since we sort it as well before putting it in, um, we, it allows us to, uh, you know, do run length encoding and compress quite a bit uh, of, uh, because of parquet format. Yeah. So uh, in terms of the, how we merge, like, if there are too many invalidation files that build up, like how do we merge and kind of, you know, um, restrict the number of IOs that happens on the query side uh, is, uh, you know, we do a tired compaction strategy and uh, every time uh, we merge, we see the number of, uh, we see the file size that comes up. And if it is beyond a size, we put it to the next level, et cetera. Uh, something uh, similar to the log structured merge strategies you would have uh, seen before. And each of these files would have the invalidated offsets again sorted. Uh, so it uh, every uh, merge allows us better, gives us better compression. And uh, this is what the invalidation file itself um, kind of looks like. Uh, so the first three columns are nothing but the log offset triplet. Um, and the rest of the columns are some metadata about what made it, what is the timestamp or what is the transaction ID that made it invalid. And uh, also, um, the uh, the final thing is the operation type that made it invalid. It's uh, it's uh, it's used in some uh, pretty uh, neat features, but not so important. Um, yeah, so that's the invalidation format itself. So summing it all up again, right? Uh, putting the bits and pieces together once again. Uh, so we get a bunch of writes. We allocate offsets, and that's part of the user transaction for commit. And uh, we write that to the table. And then all of this from this point onwards happens a bit asynchronously without blocking the transactions. And that would involve a schema inference and then uh, parquet invalidation generation and flushing the files and then checkpointing it to make it possible. So um, now uh, talking about the freshness optimizations, right? Uh, the one Andy alluded to a bit earlier, like. Um, how do we uh, make sure that we are able to give a good freshness be be between the time it takes to process something in the uh, transaction store and how long does it take to reflect in the analytical store? And the more we try to compress that uh, in order to provide better latencies, uh, it comes at the cost of generating smaller parquet files because there are enough number of writes haven't accumulated to create a 
a larger file and so on. So what we do is um, we kind of uh, um, make the last segment uh, have several incremental flushes uh, with several smaller files, but we don't finalize the segment um, until we come back and uh, redo it uh, with a larger file. So we do intermediate merges for the last segment. Um, if there are too many trickling writes and the write rate is not high enough, uh, then this will take care that um, the number of uh, files we create uh, for the lifetime isn't uh, isn't going to be too many. Uh, so uh, we do quite a bit of uh, intermediate uh, merges uh, for the last segment until we uh, have accumulated enough size such that one final uh, flush of the last segment again would create a good size and then we move on to the next segment. So uh, as in any log structured systems, we, uh, you know, we have to do garbage collection because there is uh, garbage with uh, older versions being generated. Um, and so whenever a threshold drops down uh, below a particular threshold of validity in a particular segment that is more than 50%, 40% invalid, et cetera, uh, then we uh, kind of pick up those segments for relocation. And this relocation um, it means that we are relocating the valid data in it uh, so that the entire segment can be called invalid. And, and we inter, uh, kind of interleave it with the existing uh, rights as well. And so it lands in the uh, tail of the log while invalidating the old locations for itself. So uh, that, that's uh, one level of uh, GCV that we do. There's another compaction that we do uh, that is kind of uh, we do with along with a different partitioning strategy that I'll talk about. I'll just touch upon it a little bit in the last slide. Um, so this, that, okay, so here, uh, I think that kind of uh, sum, uh, summarizes uh, in terms of the local uh, storage, uh, one unit of storage design. Now, the rest of the uh, slides are gonna talk about how it, uh, this decoupled store, analytical storage is gonna um, gel with uh, the rest of the high availability and the elasticity features that Cosmos DB provides. Um, so uh, Cosmos DB today provides a geo, a geo replication. Uh, we call it global distribution, uh, geo replication, et cetera. But it enables customers to have uh, data in each regions of their choice. And we have an internal state machine uh, for geo replication, just like we do. Ha we have an internal state machine for uh, local high availability in the, within a region. And uh, the geo replication uh, we currently do to every region that the customer configures. And so there is a copy of data in every region that the customer wants. So in, even for the analytical storage that we have, we wanted to retain that, that even um, the analytical storage should be in every region that the customer um, has the OLTP storage uh, provisioned in uh, so that uh, they, they don't see any uh, semantic differences. And uh, um, if they are able to, if they compare their OLTP views and analytical views on the same region, it should all add up and so on. And any kind of geo failovers where we uh, switch the primary status, leader status from one region to another region, uh, you know, that should kind of uh, transfer the status for the ownership of analytical storage as well. And one of the core uh, things that we did in this uh, particular thing is that uh, we used to do ge geological replication and we continue to do that. Uh, but uh, for, let's say we have a one, uh, you know, a one petabyte of some data that's present in one region for a customer and that customer chooses to add another region. And at that time, um, doing uh, you know a record level uh, replication and uh, you know reconstructing parquet on the other side etc is uh, pretty expensive in terms of CPU memory so uh, we do physical um, uh, copy of files and we interleave it with the logical replication of the steady state data etc in order to uh, seed the new region uh, with the existing copy and um, in terms of uh, uh, when configuring geo replication, all the records in um, will have the same log offset in each region, though they will be physically pointing to a different uh, physical file um, uh, in each of these regions because, uh, because we don't share data across regions. Right? Um, so those are some of the important aspects. So as I, you know, this picture kind of summarizes what I uh, spoke about where we do physical copy. Uh, for the files while interleaving it with logical replication. All of these are resumable to make sure that any of the primary failovers that we have in the OLDP database, et cetera, is able to resume the, um, resume the copies in the application. Maybe it's more like, actually, as I said at the beginning, um, 
this is something the, the customer always gets, or they have to come on and, and say they have to turn this on. Yeah, they they have to turn this on. It's uh, because it's uh, it's also cost for them uh, to have yes. another okay. presence. So it's uh, it's their decision. Yeah. But I mean, but, uh, so, no, no, I, sorry, I know that geo replications turn up, but I'm mean, saying this this generating these parquet files. Do you have to well, turn this feature on, or it's Cosmos is always doing this for people? No, th that also they have to turn on because uh, uh, they they do uh, have a, a larger presence in. Um, uh, uh, you know, larger involvement in, in the analytical query runtime part of the story. Uh, so that's why uh, it's uh, it's again their choice to have the copy of data more optimal for this. Okay, all right, thanks. So partition splits, right? So uh, Cosmos DB's elasticity story is such that uh, we are able to uh, kind of scale to any amount of throughput and uh, storage by scaling out. And this happens seamlessly where customers, uh, their workloads continue to be online while we do the uh, partition splits. And when we do the partition splits, one parent partition gives birth to two, ch two or more children. It's usually two right now. Um, and when the parent partition dies after that, split process is completed. Uh, and it kind of divides the logical key range of data between the two children. Right, and uh, since it's a since it's an activity that might impact if yeah, availability if it goes on for too long, because after a point, uh, the node's capacity of the parent will run out. So we will, there has to be a right pause in the system if the splits take too long. Um, so we uh, so well, what do we do with the analytical storage when partition splits happen? Right, uh, because each of the namespace in the decoupled storage was owned by a partition. Now it's going to die, um, but it, it, can the data die? Probably not, because it has some archival data uh, that um, that it you know, that is present only there. Uh, so it has to be continued to be referred as a valid data in the container. So these are some of the um, problems in that space. And so uh, we, you know, in order to keep the splits uh, continue to happen at a, a good rate, uh, we ship only the active snapshot and OLTP. Um, uh, you know, when uh, doing the splits. Also, so the parent partition namespace will retain the archive storage and we'll uh, continue to keep the partition set mutation history in order to make sure that we are able to reach all the uh, archive storage through the current children. And so there'll be some kind of ownership transfers, et cetera, uh, in, order to, uh, in order for the children to be able to reach out to the parent namespace. Um, so, you know, uh, pictorically, um, you can think of the it's a, you know the partition and the top kind of getting split into two, and um, the we are not copying the uh, physical files of the parent because the data is going to get divided between two partitions, so uh, we cannot just copy it as is, uh, right? Um, so we, instead we replicate uh, we kind of copy um, only the local data that is present uh, in the OLTP store and let the children generate uh, new uh, files. Uh, honoring the log offsets that were there in the parent. And um, uh, it, not just that, while, um, while a parent uh, dies, like if, for example, in this, uh, in this depiction, P0 dies by giving birth to P1 and P2, and P1 dies giving birth to P3, P4, and P5. So when P0 dies, it actually uh, transfers ownership of its archive storage to P1. And when P1 dies, it transfers P, uh, its own archive storage to one of the children, that is P3, uh, or sorry, that is P5, and it transfers its parent P0's archive storage ownership to P3. And that way, uh, all the child live partitions of a container at any one point has a reference a referential ownership to uh, one of the parents, at most one of the parents in the ancestry. And that way we'll be able to, uh, in, in the query uh, runtime, we'll be able to refer to the archive storage of the entire container. And when somebody adds a new region at this point in time to complicate things, uh, these uh, partitions which own the archive storage also own copying the its own as well as its archive storage to the other region as well in order to continue to uh, provide the same um, uh, you know guarantees that we have spoken about so far. So that kind of um, uh, you know I'm not covering a few topics related to multi-write um, because we made it a bit too simple on that and cluster migrations and so on. But that kind of summarizes the, uh, you know, um, the technical deep dives that I was trying to go into, and um, um, coming uh, stepping back, right? Why did we do all this? Uh, so uh, this architecture is something that we are using it for um, uh, other features as well, like point-in-time restore and a few others outside of HTAP as well. 
but with the with the head strap scenario um uh, we were able to uh, you know kind of compare the total cost of ownership um between uh, someone um adopting our uh, new solution versus uh, doing the traditional way of uh, doing etl uh, pipelines to um a traditional of uh, you know analytic system and so on so uh, uh, not going to go into every detail of this but this is the kind of uh, um you know the total uh, tco win that we have uh, in terms of comparing ourselves to a uh, to a system that uh, that is uh, popular, uh, so um, I'll, I'll just give it a minute on the slide. Um, I'll probably less than that. What is the bronze layer? Okay, uh, so that's kind of the uh, Delta Lakes um, medallion uh, architecture uh, where. Uh, the um, all the ingestion comes into the kind of the bronze layer. That's their recommendation uh, architecture, and all the new ingestion, uh, the raw ingestion comes into the bronze layer, and where a lot of the dedupe happens, and uh, and then it needs to be merged into existing data on the same keys, etc. That happens in the silver layer, and so on. So there is, um, uh, you know, um, duplicated storage there, and uh, and then um, kind of uh, the processing power to. Uh, do it and the end to end latency of reflecting the updates just go up. This, this is a, like the data breaks is like this is like a delta lake term. Go, correct. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Okay, right, right. Sorry. Yeah. I think you keep going. Okay, cool. Uh, so, um, in terms of the customer feedback, just carrying a couple that came to mind um, yesterday. And so, these are uh, customers who have uh, really used our um a solution to their cost and, and cost advantage and uh, uh, they are able to run it with uh, uh, great availability and cost as well uh, in terms of their solution so uh, what do we do about the roadmap right um, so uh, giving up a different partition key for the analytical storage is something that has come up um, quite a bit with our customer conversations and that's something in we have uh, um, we have uh, previewed right now, and uh, that's an important win as well. And uh, we do have something else in progress, which is to add a lot of metadata indexes um, in order to allow uh, queries to prune out a lot of files based on the properties and the filter uh, predicates and the uh, projections. Um, and we do want to provide customers a, a way to re provide a, a reduced column set for persistence in analytical storage than uh, do it all that we have right now. Um, and then expose as of timestamp queries. Since our, we have all the versions, we should be able to travel back in time. So, uh, you know, we do want to expose the query and complete the dark. Uh, these are just some uh, things that come in mind in terms of the customer facing uh, differentiated offerings. But in terms of the internal architecture, we have quite, uh, quite a few uh, improvements lined up that's going to uh, benefit even other features on top of this as well. Yeah, but like, I mean, I realize you have an app implement the feature, like what percentage of the, the columns in the row store do people actually want to include in the analytical storage? Uh, what percentage of customers? Or like, what? you know, so like you have this reduced column set, basically saying only shove out like you know, these subset of the columns on the table. Uh -huh. my, my question is like, do you have an idea of like roughly what percentage of the columns people are, would want to only include? Like, could you see this through the analytics of like of the queries you're actually running that like most queries only touch 10% of the columns on the table, 20% or so forth. Right? Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, I, I don't have that statistics right now with me, uh, but it's something that we can definitely observe in our uh, query runtime telemetry. And, um, and and I'm guessing that it's going to come down to around 40 to 50%. Uh, that's pretty much uh, um, the set of columns they are kind of interested in because, uh, uh, you know, since we are in the JSON, uh, uh, JSON document model, uh, a part of the schema is more like fixed because uh, that's like bread and butter for their application semantics. And a part of the schema uh, is like more evolving and uh, um, very uh, sparse. Uh, so uh, it's likely the ones that are going to be there for every row that they are likely uh, going to be able to do some uh, very meaningful uh, analytics on top. So I do believe it's going to be around that uh, percentage mark. 
So in terms of the learnings, uh, you know, we have quite a few, but uh, synthesizing the top two. So in terms of, uh, you know, if we if we see this architecture where uh, the WellTB is also responsible for the analytical storage, which is in a decoupled medium and so on, there is, uh, uh, there is an availability dependency that, uh, you know, uh, because we need to do recovery, uh, et cetera. And, um, uh, you know, um, as we want to increase the amount of parquet file size, the amount of recovery we have to do also increases when the uh, OLTB primary fails over, et cetera. All right, so we uh, innovated uh, quite a bit here in order to reduce the impact of this recovery on the uh, OLTB stores availability, like if a primary swap happens, uh, due to load balancing or node failures, we wanted to happen fast and not be stuck behind recovery of this remote storage and so on. Uh, so um, we we did uh, quite a bit of um, um, uh, you know uh, features in the space in terms of asynchronous recovery and so on, uh, in order to uh, kind of keep the um, uh, order of constant uh, recovery time uh, due to uh, analytical storage. And we also did uh, certain things like, you know, treat the in incremental file flushes as, as if it's durable for the purpose of recovery and so on in order to uh, continue to um, optimize on that. And uh, another thing in general is that uh, iterative development, uh, as much as it's good to go to market and, uh, and gather customer traction, um, it is it is quite uh, challenging in terms of uh, um, in a, in a, especially in a past service where we own the data as well as uh, uh, own the upgrade stories, own the um, uh, servicing, etc. Uh, so we have to uh, you know kind of. Uh, continue to support the customers that are in the, all the different formats in different um, uh, iterations of our uh, of our offering, and uh, so that's uh, quite a bit of effort uh, that goes in planning those updates in a uh, non-destructive way and in an unimpactful way. So uh, that's something uh, that um, we continue to learn from and optimize, uh, but uh, it, it does take quite a bit of time in this. And last but not least, I'm almost at the end. Uh, our team is hiring um, a lot. This is just one of the fish to fry. Uh, we have a lot more bigger fishes to fry in terms of running a, a globally distributed uh, database service, a lot of uh, lead reduction problems um, in doing geo failovers, et cetera. Uh, so, um, uh, and we are also embarking on distributed SQL, et cetera. So, uh, I, you know, a lot of uh, great problems to solve. So, uh, happy to. Uh, hear from a lot of these bright minds uh, at CMU and uh, have them guide us uh, where we should take and how we should plan for the next decades. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. I am open to questions. I will applaud that for everyone else. I will say, like, most people here on this call actually aren't, I don't think, are from Carnegie Mellon. So there's, there's other awesome people outside of CMU, although we are awesome. Okay. Um, okay, so I open the floor to uh, to the audience. If anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and fire away at the hurry. Otherwise, I will ask my questions. All right, you're all suffers. Um, so this is interesting that you guys are making heavy use of Pro-K for almost everything. Um, I was wonder if you could comment on like, since you guys are running at Parquet at like you know massive scale, uh, you know what aspects do you find in Parquet frustrating or limiting, and you would actually want to improve them? And you know, like if you could change the Parquet spec, what would you change? Um, and then you know, is is the you know, do you think it could have a better you know compression ratio, or do you think it could have Better computational efficiency for processing the files. Like, what's what's the main limitation you're seeing with Parquet? Um, so, I, I I would say two. One is um, uh, one is the fact that the support for schema evolution, right? Uh, like, for example, a data uh, because in our JSON free uh, JSON's uh, schema free model, uh, a column can be an integer, uh, though it's it's rare and it doesn't happen that often in a in a carefully designed workload. Um, it can be integer on one day, but it can be a string on another day. Uh, and in those cases, uh, call a, a parquet doesn't uh, kind of support, as far as I know, um, uh, doesn't support uh, the same column name being uh, two different data types, et cetera. And that, uh, is, that is quite important for full fidelity because uh, um, uh, you know, uh, one needs to, uh, because, uh, because we are trying to push the 
data uh, cleaning aspect to customers, uh, uh, you know, the, the query layer, uh, because they will be able to better make sense of why it would have happened and so on. So it's important to even reflect that correctly uh, to, the, to the customer side so that they are able to better process it. But right now we are not able to reflect it well unless uh, we do, uh, we have, we, we provide another option called full fidelity uh, schema inference uh, for customers to opt in. Uh, but uh, uh, that would make it um, pretty hard to write queries because you would have to say uh, column A underscore int, select, uh, select column A underscore int from table and select column A underscore string from table and whatnot, right? So um, that, it, it's not very uh, easy to design that. So that's one thing. And the second thing uh, would be uh, the some level of support to uh, mutate a file once it's written, right? Um, so uh, what, what would it uh, uh, take to add, uh, maybe add some metadata, add some property bag, um, et cetera. Uh, it's not, uh, it's like, um, uh, it's like, you know, once it is written, it's, uh, it's, it's, that's it. And, um, and that's kind of uh, um, making it a little harder. Um, but th those are the two things that I would, uh, um, that I would say, yeah. The same problem like the, the, the Apache Hootie guys have for one house, right? That like you have to maintain the Delta for the updates and then merge it later. Right, um, exactly. yeah. Okay. All right, question for virtual. Yeah, uh, uh, two simple or quick, quick questions. Number one is uh, the grooming uh, from OLTP into your uh, uh, OLAP. Um, what is the time interval you do that? Is that, and when, how do you tune it? Is it in seconds, minutes? Hours? Oh yeah, uh, it, it's a, if we, if we try to do it at every 30 seconds now, that should be, uh, that should be the case. So. Uh, yeah, uh, we try to uh, force a flush with whatever records have come in in the last 30 seconds, and that would generate an incremental file. Uh, while uh, And when a good amount of records have accumulated for this current segment, we finalize into a one larger file later. All right. And second part is, uh, do you support uh, time travel queries? Uh, uh, currently, our uh, storage is able to support it, uh, but uh, we haven't worked on exposing that in the query layer yet. Uh, so that uh, that's that query uh, surface area has to be uh, hooked up. Cool. Thank you. Very nice work. Thanks. Thanks. Anybody else? When did um when did Cosmos TV or when did you guys that support for SQL? Is it recent or is it a few years ago? Uh, T SQL, you mean? Yeah. Uh, that was only made possible through this um, because we have a, our own version of SQL querying. Uh, okay. that is not exactly T SQL, that is, uh, uh, but it, uh, it is based on ANSI SQL. So it does provide a good amount of feature coverage uh, on, but that is to query our OLTP data. Okay. okay. Um, and I guess the question is, I, I, my last question is sort of, um, it's more about JSON stuff or JSON data. Of course, you guys see a lot of it, so you need to, need to characterize it. Like, I guess, how, I mean, you sort of mentioned this how, like, there's sort of this I mean, question is like, how regular is it? Like, you mentioned that there's like there's this core data that you, you have certain keys or attributes in documents, and then there's like a sort of random stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you said there's sometimes people make mistakes or there's random data where it should be 99% of the time it's an integer, but someone throws a string in there. Mm -hmm. I guess, I mean, how common do you see this in most applications? Uh, it's it's not common in uh, pr production quality workloads. Um, it is more, uh, you know, it is more like development time workloads as well as, okay. uh, yeah, so uh, it's not as common as we thought. Okay. 